far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 92 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that two of them think doing a podcast called Digital Watches Are a Pretty Neat Idea is a pretty neat idea. They are Jeff and Brian. Hi there, this is Jeff, I'm with my friend Brian, and this is our summer solstice bonus episode. Hey Jeff, how are you? Well, I'm doing great, Brian, how are you? Well, Jeff, I, I'm stuck thinking about time. Thinking about time? <laughs> yes, I just can't get it out of my head. <laughs> you're you're going to think I'm so weird, but you know, you've known me for a long time, so. <laughs> yes, I do think you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So after our last conversation, we were talking about the age of the universe. And right the distance that we know exists and how the entire expansion of the universe uh, occurred in a Planck time right. unit. And I got to thinking after that, I started to think about a universal standard for time. Okay. <laughs> and I and how they have this, one? Yes. Well, I mean, at, at how one would exist, actually. Right. Because if you think about it, and, and I'm going to shorten this conversation so we don't go on to forever here, because we could definitely go down this rabbit hole way deeper than I can imagine. But just so you have some idea what I was thinking about, there were two things that were bothering me about that. And that is that when you think about time, we divide time up based on the Earth's orbit around the sun. And how fast it spins. Exactly, exactly. So we're, we're looking at the night-day cycle and the 365-ish days that it takes for the Earth to go around. So those yes. particular units of distance and time are divided back down into the minutes and seconds and all of these divisions that we currently know. Mm -hmm. And I thought... But those things are all relative to our place in the universe, our our galaxy, our Earth, our sun, right. you know, our distance from the sun. So they're very, very specific. And our understanding of time is related to those factors. So I started thinking about, <laughs> well, how could you come up with a standard for the entire universe as a standard of measured time because you would need two pieces you would need a standard distance and you would need an interval and <laughs> you would need definitely an interval mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily need a distance right right it would just be arbitrary exactly it would seemingly be arbitrary and then this is why it's, it's such a deep rabbit hole, okay? So I'm puzzled about this, and then I got to thinking, and I mentioned to the one other person I know who can have, <laughs> other than yourself, actually, that could have this conversation and contribute some valuable information. And that was with my, I'll call her my niece-in-law, Alyssa. Okay. And uh, she, I, I happened to see her the other day at my nephew's wedding. And I got a chance to talk to her. And she came up with a brilliant observation, which is something we already know. And that is that we, the frequency we can get from the pulsating frequency of atoms. So okay. if, if we chose the right atom, uh, we could have the frequency and use that for a definition as part of the time. All right. But there was another piece that I didn't quite know until she pointed it out. And I, I said, how did we get to... 12 hours and 24 hours and why are we not a decimal based approach to time 
And she made an observation, which I really didn't know until she pointed it out. If you look at your hand, okay, okay. it doesn't matter, right or left hand, and you look at it and you start counting with your hand, and she pointed this out to me, you count each finger, you've got three basic segments. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Four fingers, right? Three joints, three segments, and she used and she told me this is the way that human beings counted forever: one hand, twelve segments, and the twelve and the twenty-four second hand. So that's how they became a standard in the human existence of twelve, <laughs> which I found absolutely fascinating. But I was surprised that it wasn't stuck in my arcane vault of knowledge. <laughs> right. Well, now it is. <laughs> now Absolutely. it is. So don't you regret spending all this time talking to me now? <laughs> no. No. The only theory I wanted to posit about universal time mm -hmm. is, and again, we don't know where life or other life is in the universe. That's correct. We have to believe that there is some, mm -hmm. but we don't know. Right. And when we look, there are planets that are around suns that we term the Goldilocks zone. Right. So what I'm going to surmise is that all of the planets capable of sustaining life mm -hmm. in the Goldilocks zone mm -hmm. are very similar in the size of the sun and distance from the sun and orbit. So all of the times would be similar. Right. Right. Yes, they talk about Ford being from, you know, a planet off of Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. But the sun Alpha Centauri makes our sun look like the Earth to it. Right. Like the way <laughs> the way the Earth looks to our sun, mm -hmm. that's the way our sun looks to Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. So I can't believe that there's a Goldilocks zone planet around Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There could be, but it would be <laughs> so far out that their calendar year, the way we have it, right. could be a, a hundred or a thousand years <laughs> to go all the way around that at an orbit that was comfortable. Right, because right. Because I'm sure it's a hotter sun. Right, right. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I'm going to say that all the planets in the Goldilocks zone mm -hmm. have a similar sized sun mm -hmm. and a similar distance in a similar orbit. So universal time would be easier to just take an average <laughs> of all the different planets. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> But you can see the heart of gold has I, artificial nuts. Yeah, that's true. They have a they do have a time mm -hmm. that they say mm -hmm. this is night, this is day. So. That's right. That's right. And it it just it was like I said, I it was a rabbit hole that I've fallen into, and I'm still trying to scramble my way out of it. And at some and time in the near in future, I'll be <laughs> I will be out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But until then, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about issue two of the Restaurant at the End of the Universe comic book. Right. Fantastic. And so this cover has everybody panicked on a little black ship. Mm -hmm. hmm, I wonder what ship that could be. <laughs> <laughs> and it surely looks like a little black ship on this cover because they're all jammed together and you can see them through the windshield. Yes, and Millie Ways is in the background, so they are leaving Millie Ways. Right, right. And it looks like Zaphod's actually got his hand on what looks like a eight ball. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So there are like four controls that Zaphod and Ford are both using. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, of course, Arthur is still holding a cup of tea That's that right. is being splashed around. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's Trillian in the background, hanging out with Marvin. The cover art is similar to the last book, uh, with the title yep. page being similar. Yes. Other than that, are there new characters on this? New uh, writers? No, they're all the same. Uh, they're all the same. Okay. Shepard Hendricks is still, still in this one, mm -hmm. so he was the new guy in the first issue. Right. 
Well, before we get into the book, like I mentioned, we're going to look at a couple of more trading cards awesome. from the set. Mm -hmm. So the first one I'm going to show is one of the hologram cards. Oh, neat. And so it's really difficult to show a hologram on a computer screen, but <laughs> you can kind of see... This is the Beeblebrocks we've got you covered where they're in the sights. Mm -hmm. And the hologram is kind of 3D, which is good because if you remember Trillion mm -hmm. in that picture would look better in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is hard to see, like you said, on the screen. Yeah. And again, it's much different in person, obviously, because mm -hmm. you can tilt it back and forth and get different angles. Right. The lenticular nature of the picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is also going to be a hologram card. All right. And this is where Zaphod steals the heart of gold. Mm. And I don't remember this image from the comic, do you? No, no. So it's nice that it's a unique one. It's funny. This is the first your first image where you see the bottom of the shoe, you know, like the, the, yeah. the, the bottom <laughs> side. And it does look like a big footprint. Right. And his paralyzo bomb didn't seem to work very long because everybody seems to be waving and yelling and shouting <laughs> as he's flying away. <laughs> then we're going to have the tech chrome cards. Okay. And this is Zaphod on the run. <laughs> this looks like a poster for when he was running for president. Yes, his campaign poster. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's funny, he's wearing a double-breasted jacket, right? <laughs> yes, it's... You know, very Sergeant Pepperish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then the next Tech Chrome card is Slarty Barkfast makes his mark. Mm. Hm. So I'm not exactly sure what he's doing there because he looks like he's in shackles. <laughs> right, right. Oh, he's controlling the laser that's carving out all the fjords. Ah, that's it. A virtual reality approach. <laughs> yes. And then the next Tech Chrome card is Trillian Brings the Mice. <laughs> so Trillian is holding a cage of the two mice. Mm -hmm. And is that supposed to be Arthur in the background? I'm not sure. With the blonde hair? I don't know. And what's behind him there? Is that a spaceship behind him? Or, or is that Zaphod with only one head? Oh, there you go. That's probably Zaphod with one head. And the other one dressed up or dis disguised or something. Yes, it's talking about the galactic president. Uh, let's see, what does it say? On hindsight, bringing the mice along was a good idea, but just you try explaining it to a future galactic president when he's impatient to get off the planet. Right. His space speeder is double parked, and he's got a pending appointment to have extra extremities added. Okay. So they're saying they had... A, oh, I gotcha. Okay, yeah, so that's Zaphod. Yes, but it goes... With one head and two arms instead. <laughs> but he only had the arm added extra, not the head. Right. Especially because Grandpa has two heads. <laughs> so is that the name of your punk band, Grandpa Has Two Heads? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, man. They're trying to fit it in there. <laughs> and then the last Tech Chrome card... Is Ford hitches a ride. Ford hitches a <laughs> ride. I love it. So he's standing underneath what does not look like a Vogon ship. No. That looks like a ship from, uh, I don't know, 2001, A Space Odyssey or something? I think this is just Ford pre-Earth when he was hitching, because it just says, Ford Prefect manages a hitch onto an oddly familiar and staggeringly expensive looking means of transportation. Oddly familiar is exactly right. For some reason, I've seen that spaceship in my mind, and I can't place where. I can't tell you either. You know what? I'm thinking about the Close Encounters spaceship, I think. From oh, Close Encounters yeah, that... of, the first, of the Third Kind? Yes, that's probably where it came from. It is similar to that. Mm. All right, so now we will get into the book. Again, start out with kind of the copyright page. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then we have... All our favorite actors. <laughs> Story, breakdowns, and art by all people that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Both Laverne and John are here again, so nobody knew in this issue. Right. And then we have a concert poster. <laughs> Disaster area. Mm -hmm. Last kiss before the cataclysm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Those are some odd characters. <laughs> He's got them to cover there. You kissing creatures? <laughs> yeah, I guess. It almost looks like a single creature at a glance. Mm-hmm. Like they're stuck together and trying to explode apart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> stuck together by the lips. <laughs> and then there's the restaurant Genesis. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so now we got to read this oh, and then geez. talk about it. <laughs> You'd say there'd be homework. <laughs> So this page, they say it's the restaurant Genesis. So basically, he's saying that people ask him where he gets his ideas from. Mm -hmm. And he basically admits that he doesn't have any idea where they come from. (laughs) (laughs) But he does say that the restaurant at the end of the universe idea was inspired by a track called Grand Hotel by Procol Harum. Oh, sure. And most of the song is talking about an opulent restaurant, and he says that it comes to a crescendo for no apparent reason, and he wondered what it signified, and he thought, well, it's probably just the end of the universe. So <laughs> that's that's where he says the idea came from. All right. It works for me. It's got to come from somewhere. Yep. Yes. Yep. Interesting. These are words that I haven't read from Douglas Adams before. Right. Look at that. First time. Mm-hmm. So the comic book starts out with the back of a cereal box. (laughs) Ah, yes, where most wisdom and knowledge is stored. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it has some interesting information to help you live in the universe. And it talks about the area, the imports, the exports, and the population. Mm -hmm. Which are nothing, nothing, and nothing. Right. (laughs) (laughs) They left out sex. Oh, did they? Maybe it's on the next page. <laughs> no, it's it's not. I looked. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm saying is on the box, uh-huh. there's not, a, you know, mm-hmm. and they also left out currency. Mm-hmm. They edited this down, edited this down for the comic book. Yes. And then on the next page. Ah, our favorites. <laughs> right. <laughs> Living up in the trees. Who are they again? What are they called? Okay, so this is a two-page spread showing the Oglarune planet, where the entire yep. intelligent, in quote, beings live in a single tree and eat right. Oglanuts. Right. And the only thing that you can get thrown out of the tree for is thinking that there's another place to exist on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And again, they tossed in one of these intelligent beings carving 42 into the side of the tree. Yes. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. Yeah, I can't imagine they could do much carving in that tree and all live there happily for the rest of their lives. That's right. (laughs) There wouldn't be much tree (laughs) left. So they're telling the story of these creatures to come back around to the total perspective vortex, which is where we left... Zaphod last time we had just gone in Mm -hmm. and it shows a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot with a sign that says you are here Mm -hmm. and then somebody says hi could I have a drink please (laughs) feeble brocks (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh and so Zaphod emerges unscathed Mm mm-hmm and there he encounters a piece of fairy cake, which in this particular looks like a cupcake. Yep. So he says that he was in there and that it was working and he saw himself and his relation to the universe. And what did it tell him? He's a really great guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And he stuffs the fairy cake into his second head. (laughs) Right. (laughs) All right. What does it say? So a rather stunned Gargravar gives Zaphod a head start before he informs his masters of the escape. And so Zaphod leaves. And he's on the abandoned planet wandering around in what looks rather desolate area. Yeah. Till he comes... The whack tripping over a large cable. Oh, right. Which he inspects and hears a humming. It looks like some sort of a space liner. Mm-hmm. 
He takes a cup and puts it up against the side of the space liner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then he can hear the announcements uh-huh. about the short delay. He looks at the board and sees that the ship has been delayed for 900 years. Yikes. And so then he goes on, and he's told to return to a seat over and over. By a mechanical stewardess. Who's explaining that there's a short delay, but they're going to get their lemon soaked napkins and all the coffee and biscuits <laughs> as all the people are screaming. <laughs> and Zephyr even looks horrified. Yes, he he's does. trying to get out. Slams his way into the captain's cabin. Yep. Where he's informed that passengers are not allowed to be there. Right. Please return to your seat. Please return to your seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. He tries to have a conversation with the robot captain, who gleefully explains their delay. Oh, and Zephyr tells him that uh, civilization has come and gone, man. <laughs> There's going to be no lemon-soaked napkins coming. <laughs> and he says, well, we'll wait. <laughs> It, yeah. It's bound to return. <laughs> yeah, it's likely that another civilization's going to arise. <laughs> but until then, mm-hmm. there'll, there'll be, be a short slight delay. delay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then uh, Zarni Whoop comes into cockpit area. Mm-hmm. And I would have expected him to be a more imposing character. Oh, definitely. Here he's a small greenish man, pink sunglasses on, baldish head. Looks like an antenna, yeah. maybe. <laughs> and he's way shorter than Zaphod. He doesn't yes. even come up to his shoulder. Yes, yes. Holding a briefcase. And he explains that when he entered the door to his office, that he entered his electronically synthesized universe. And that if he had left by the door, he would have been back in the real one. Mm-hmm. And the artificial one works from the briefcase that he happens to be holding. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, what's the difference between this universe and the real one? And Zarni Whoop explains that they are identical, except for one thing. And he says, I think the frog starfighters are gray in the real universe. (laughs) (laughs) Zephyr's like, what's going on? (laughs) Okay, so next scene, we see the spaceship and some thought bubbles where I guess Zarni Whoop is explaining to Zephyr... Uh, about the man who rules the universe. Yeah, and he discovered the coordinates where he is. But he's protected by an unprobability field. There we go. And that he goes on to explain that he and Zaphod came up with this plan to discover the gentleman. Zaphod is not having any of it. He's very red in the face. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> He can't believe what's going on. Mm-hmm. Oh, and he explains that the reason he survived the total perspective vortex is because that universe was created specifically for him. Mm-hmm. So he was the most important person in the universe. <laughs> He'd have never survived the real one. <laughs> and then he goes back out into the passenger section of the space liner where everyone is screaming and yelling. And... Zephod asks, where are we going? And Zarni Whoop says, the heart of gold. You did bring it, I trust. <laughs> Once again, of course, Zephod no, has no idea what's going on. Zarni Whoop says, it's a very remarkable ship, very powerful. And Zephod's like, you mean I had the ship with me all the time? Yeah, here they don't mention, actually, they show a picture of, of Zarni Whoop grabbing Zephod's jacket And it looks kind of like that's where the ship materializes from. Yes, it was in his pocket. And once more, he is informed that he is entwined in the improbability field and he cannot escape what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he decked him. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) Schmack. And his... Of course, Zarni Wu pushes the button to reanimate the real universe. And meanwhile, on the ship, it looks like everybody's having a grand old time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> meanwhile, back on the ship. Trillian sleeping in the captain's chair. Arthur's lying on the floor. <laughs> Ford is flailing about. 
miserable. And he's screaming, the ship is working again. The ship is working again. Because Eddie came on. Hi there, guys. It's really <laughs> great to be back. And they're told that they're on Frogstar. And Zaphod shows up and everybody greets him. Yes. And he's like, hey, four trillion monkey man. <laughs> and wait, Zardy Whoop is there. <laughs> yes, he is. I did. I thought he was going to leave without him this time because mm-hmm. I didn't think he'd follow him after he got punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then let's see here. What's going on here in these bottom panels? Well, Zaphod wants to get something to eat because he's still very hungry. And mm-hmm. he just tells Eddie, doesn't matter where we go, just take us to the nearest place to eat. And then poof, Zarni Whoop is all by himself. On the Heart of Gold. Gotcha. And they have disappeared. Mm Mm-hmm. And now they're all laying on the floor. (laughs) In a tangled mass. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Saying, good evening, madam, gentlemen. Do you have a reservation? And this is where they're confused and think it's the afterlife. Right. Uh, Let's see here. Well, I assume so. I mean, there's no way we could have survived that blast, says Ford. Right. No, we were a goner. (laughs) (laughs) I certainly didn't survive. A total goner, man. Kerplow. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So they're still having a conversation. And they're lying dead or standing, standing dead in a desolate five-star restaurant. It says Trillion. (laughs) And then there's a wider shot where they're leaning on the bar <laughs> and they're looking around, trying to take it all in, still trying to figure out where they are. And this is where Arthur says more of an après V. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then Zaphod says he thinks they're missing something or somebody, something somebody said. Zaphod says, hey, hang about, you dead guys. I think we're missing some ultra important thing here. You know, something somebody said. And then they talk about everything that they've said. And then the maitre d' asks again, or asks if they want drinks. And she's like, drinks! That's what it was. (laughs) But he didn't ask. Right. When you're looking at the comic before this, everything that was happening in the restaurant, there wasn't ever a word bubble coming off from the side asking about drinks. No, the only thing the Mater D said was, do you have a reservation? Right. Never asked about drinks. So again, they kind of, they do the joke without doing the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why it gets frustrating, you know? And then again, the Mater D says that the universe will explode later for their pleasure. Mm-hmm. And again, they miss it because Zaphod says, right. wow, what kind of drinks do you serve here? Mm-hmm. But that's Ford's line. <laughs> right, that is Ford's line. And then everybody shouts about the time journey. Yeah, because he said that makes people disoriented. And I didn't realize the guy was a satyr. Yeah, I know. That's what I was just about to say. In this particular shot, you can see him with uh, goat legs and kind of a goatee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, and then here again, this is... Later, we're going to see that there is slight, not a flaw of the of this comic compared to the book, but the book in general, because they all thought they were dead. Mm-hmm. The Matrix says, sir, is most evidently alive. Otherwise, I would not attempt to serve, sir. But we do realize later that they do serve dead people. <laughs> they do, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the Mater D takes one of his goat hooves and opens a curtain for them to follow him to their table. And says that the universe will end in just a few minutes. <laughs> oh my. And this is a double page spread in the pastels of narration of explaining Millie Way's The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. And all of the impossible things that happen. Mm-hmm. So if you've done six impossible things this morning, why not round it off with breakfast at Millie Way's, the <laughs> restaurant at the end of the universe? Exactly. Oh, and another double page spread. That is a big restaurant. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a huge restaurant. <laughs> it's more like a 
like an arena. Right. With thousands and thousands of people all milled around. You can't see the dolphin pods floating up in the sky, though, outside. (laughs) No, you cannot. You can see the uh, main stage and a couple of the various characters along the side as they wander down towards their table. Yep. With the Mater D. (laughs) Okay, so all along the panel, we're we're regaled with stories about uh, drinks. And then the final panel on this particular page You've got Trillian trying to console Arthur that he really hasn't lived. And Arthur says, you call this life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he steals uh, Marvin's line. <laughs> yeah. And they're trying to find out from Zephod what happened because he had disappeared. And now all of a sudden they're all together again. Mm-hmm. And I like this line. If you want to know what happened... Let's just say I had the whole situation in my pocket. <laughs> there you go. Which really doesn't give them an answer. No, <laughs> no, not, not even close. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ford now is really looking drunk. Oh, yes. Definitely is in his cups, as they say. And he sees an old mate of his, Hot Black Desiato. <laughs> and he wanders over there spilling drinks everywhere. And if I didn't know that had to be Trillian next to Zaphod, I wouldn't have realized that was Trillian. No, not at all. (laughs) Some of the, I I think like the uh, scene, the artists are getting a little lazier. (laughs) (laughs) Less, less and fewer and fewer lines, I'll say, being used to depict the characters. (laughs) Yes, and the... The attention to making sure the characters look the same in every panel goes away. Yes, absolutely. Like, if you look at the top right panel versus the middle left panel, there's about a 150-pound difference between those trillions. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So Ford is just going on and on and on about Hot Black and all of the exploits that they had. And then he's continuing going on and on and on about all of his exploits <laughs> and getting absolutely no response at all. Yep. Spills his drink all over Hot Black. Hot Black doesn't respond. Gets two more drinks and spills those on everybody else and <laughs> yes. himself. Oh, and then the bodyguard comes over. Mm-hmm. Looks like he's Hot Black's actually sitting next to a pair of asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, strange creatures. Yes. And he is told that Hot Black speaks to no one, or Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Correct. And Ford wants to know what's the matter with him. And then it jumps to a narration the of... pastel pink pages, yep. <laughs> a narration about Disaster Area, the band that Hot Black Desiato has started. Mm-hmm. Plutonium rock band. And they're the loudest band, actually the loudest noise of any kind, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that they don't even play on the planet. They plan orbiting a planet or a nearby planet. (laughs) (laughs) Looks like in the picture they show uh, Hot Black actually playing an instrument similar to a saxophone. Yes. Which is kind of odd. And the best place to hear the concert is from concrete bunkers some 37 miles from the stage. (laughs) I've been to those concerts. (laughs) Yeah. Simple songs follow a familiar theme. Boy Mm. being meets girl being beneath a silvery moon, which then explodes for no adequate explored reason. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. And they have the disaster area posters all strewn about Yes. Another page explaining Hot Black and the mathematics that it takes to understand his economic condition. Yes. And that his band is banned on many planets because his band contravenes local strategic arms limitation treaties. (laughs) Yes. And about their finances, their chief research accountant has recently been appointed professor of mathematics at the University of Maximegalon Mm -hmm. in recognition of both his general and special theories of disaster area tax returns. 
<laughs> in which he proves that the whole fabric of the space-time continuum is not merely curved, it is in fact totally, totally bent. bent. <laughs> <laughs> I love totally bent. Yes. <laughs> then we arrive back on the scene where Ford now realizes he ought to get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Zaphod wants to know if he met up with the big noise boy. Mm hmm. And Forsay didn't say a whole lot because he's spending a year dead for tax reasons. Mm hmm. And the maitre d' returns and asks him if they'd like to see the menu or would you like to meet the dish of the day? And then Max Cordelpleen is doing his thing up on stage. And he looks like the Joker. He does look like the Joker. <laughs> Although his fingers are quite sharp and pointy. <laughs> yeah, he is very reminiscent of the Joker. Batman's the Joker. <laughs> and the next page, we see him bowing to the audience and talking about the evening. And we see a picture of Thor and his related gods. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And Max is doing a great job of his explanation of the night's events and the end of history itself. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I thought the scene in the TV show was bad. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Although probably technically more accurate, this is far more disturbing. <laughs> yes, they are definitely exploring all of the cuts of meat on this animal. Mm-hmm. As he's pointing out different parts of his body that might be delicious in a white wine sauce. Some off the shoulder. And Arthur cannot deal <laughs> with wanting to eat an animal that wants to be eaten. Mm -hmm. And he's told it's better than eating an animal that doesn't want to be eaten. I don't care. <laughs> I can't think about it now. And Zaphod is probing the body here and there. Yes. While the animal smiles <laughs> complacently. <laughs> Very bizarre. Oh my gosh. And now the <laughs> the animal is leaning up with his big cow eyes, is <laughs> leaning up the back of Arthur, pleading with him. <laughs> and Arthur wants to have a salad. Oh. A green salad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's told that he knows some vegetables that might think that was inappropriate. Which is the whole reason that they bred an animal that wanted to be eaten and was capable of saying so clearly and distinctly. And here he is. <laughs> and then Arthur shouts for a glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. He's being wheeled away, and he's saying, don't worry, I'll be very humane, as he goes off to shoot himself. <laughs> <laughs> as Zaphod orders four rare steaks. And then, of course, Zaphod has the line, hey, Earthman, what's eating you? <laughs> <laughs> and Max doing more of his showmanship. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Really pouring it on thick. Oh, absolutely. I love the scene in the bottom left with the, the odd characters. Yes, they are <laughs> entranced by yes, this performance. Yes, they are. <laughs> and at the end of the universe, there's going to be nothing. Void, emptiness, oblivion, absolutely nothing. Nothing except, of course, the sweet trolley and a fine selection of Aldebaran liqueurs. <laughs> <laughs> I still love this picture on the bottom left. It's really driving me crazy. It looks like... Patrick <laughs> from SpongeBob uh, yes. and Patrick has shown up. <laughs> Patrick has shown up, yes. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of weird characters there. Mm -hmm. On the next page, Max is reporting about the different groups of people who are there. The Bridge Club, which looks like a bunch of old ladies with white hair. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Minor deities from the halls of Asgard. Careful with that hammer, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and then the joke that I didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 
blame the dog. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh my gosh. They're all sitting around dog food bowls. It's funny. And then, of course, he introduces the group that are there to meet the great prophet Sarquan. And all the jokes at their expense. Mm-hmm. And more build up and build up for the end of the universe. On the next page, Arthur is in a panic because he's thinking that if the universe ends, shouldn't they get the heck out of there? <laughs> Ford is still clearly drunk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Zaphod's there too. No, oh, yeah, he's smashed. <laughs> <laughs> and sticking oh, out his goodness. tongue again, being childish. <laughs> mm hmm. The Mater D returns, telling Zaphod that there's a telephone call for him. And he's can't understand who would be on the phone. Trillian says, perhaps it's the police. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zaphod responds, you mean they want to arrest me over the phone? Because <laughs> he's dangerous when he gets cornered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And Ford is laughing, saying he goes to pieces so fast, people get hit by the shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this picture of Arthur just deteriorating here. <laughs> yes, because he thinks it's going to be Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. And Zaphod wants to know who's on the phone, and he's told that he's not personally acquainted with the metal gentleman in question, but he's been waiting for a considerable number of millennia. Mm -hmm. And then there's the before we arrived here, we left here <laughs> yes. conversation. <laughs> And then Arthur actually figures it out and gets yelled at by Zaphod. Mm-hmm. And he is again very angry and red-faced, telling him to go bang his heads together. <laughs> uh... But the maitre d' informs them that your monkey's got it right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So in the upper right-hand panel... What is Ford all upset about? <laughs> I have no idea. Everybody's just sitting there calmly and Ford's like got his hands up in the air yelling at something. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're doing the wave in the background. <laughs> <laughs> that could He's be. the only one responding. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so this is where it's all put together that when Zaphod said to send them to the nearest place to eat since... Millie Ways was built on the ruins of Frogstar World B, where the total perspective vortex was. Mm -hmm. They moved in time, but not in space. Right. And we are returning to our friend, the paranoid android. Yes. Who's looking rather pathetic with bandages all across his body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Zafi says, it's Marvin. And one of them is like, smug and the others really confused mm -hmm. of his two heads and of course he's complaining that he's feeling rather depressed right and so Zaphod has a conversation with Marvin and Marvin tells him how horrible the job is and that he can stick his head in a bucket <laughs> <laughs> oh he just called to say he wanted to wash his head at us <laughs> yes <laughs> Zaphod wants to know where he is. Zaphod asks where he is. Marvin says, I'm in the car park. He's like, what are you doing there? Parking cars. What else does one do in a car park? <laughs> <laughs> and so then Zaphod tells the group to go. They're going to get going to find Marvin. And Arthur asks, what's he doing in the car park? <laughs> <laughs> Parking cars, of course, you dumb dumb. <laughs> <laughs> So oh. Zaphod signs Hot Black's name to their check. Mm -hmm. And now, for some reason, Arthur doesn't want to leave because he wants to see the end of the universe. Right. <laughs> Zaphod told him that he's seen it, it's rubbish, it's nothing but a ganab gib. Ganab gib. <laughs> Opposite of a Big Bang. Oh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> now, they don't do the whole scene at the restaurant with the uh, dishes and the explanation and... You know, when they move the, move the plates around and explain the... Uh, oh, no, he didn't. Ebony he bathtub didn't. And, right. and all that stuff. <laughs> no, they, they did cut all that out. It's a little lengthy. Mm-hmm. And so... 
<laughs> they take Ford and they yes. throw him into some machine that sobers him up. Ah, how handy that is. I don't know why Zaphod didn't get into that machine because he seemed to be looking a little hammered Peaked. previously. Yep. Oh my gosh. And then they go down an elevator tube down to the car park. And Trillian sees Marvin down on the lower deck. Ford wants to know why they don't take the personal teleport, time teleports, that'll get him straight back to the Heart of Gold. And Zaphod says, because he's done with the ship, Zarni Whoop can have it. Let's see what we can find. Right. Well, there's an interesting expression on Zaphod's face. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Very few lines. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's interesting because they're showing Marvin here. And he's, of course, in a dilapidated state or in the previous pictures, he had little patches all over him. But right. in each of these different panels, he's got what looks like like a zigzaggy line all the way down the right side of his body. Like yes. He's had it repaired. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everything on the right side has been fixed. <laughs> right. Not the left, though. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And Marvin explains that for 576,000 million years, he's counted them. He has been waiting for them on Frogstar World B. Mm. The first 10 million were the worst. And the second 10 million, <laughs> they were the worst, too. And the third 10 million, I didn't enjoy that at all. After that... <laughs> I went into a bit of a decline. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's the people that you meet in the job that really let you down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Ford and Zaphod are checking out all the ships in the car park. Uh, we know the jokes about the different cars, right? Yep. Like different buggies, vehicles. Now here Ford is looking at a vehicle that's got disaster areas trademark yes where he sees hot black's ship right and this is purple and silver and all that kind of stuff right and next to it is parked a really black ship mm-hmm and zaphod is intrigued it's a mother of a mover <laughs> and, and asks ford what do you reckon ford's like what do you mean just stroll off with it do you think we should no, nor do I. <laughs> hey, Marvin. Hey, Marvin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I won't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you will. There's a whole new life stretching out before you. Oh, no, not another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, will you shut up and listen? This time there's going to be excitement and adventure. <laughs> I suppose you want me to open that spaceship for you. <laughs> That's right. Well, I wish you'd just tell me rather than trying to enable my enthusiasm because I haven't got one. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the restaurant, Hot Black on his levitating chaise lounge <laughs> is... Oh, now it's got wheels. It's got wheels in the right panel. Yeah. And... Yep, yep. Oh, no, it doesn't. I see. They're... Like le levitating thrusters, I think they're Levitating... To... Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. His... Levitating Shay's Lounge is time to leave, and he's going back to his ship. Mm -hmm. He's told what a great show he will have had <laughs> when <Yep>. he returns. <laughs> and the new ship is a real beauty, and he's going to set it on autopilot to crash into the sun. And meanwhile, back at the restaurant, the universe is screaming into the void. Yes. And just before the universe ends, there's a clap, <laughs> clap, hooray. <laughs> and who should arrive but the, the great, great prophet, prophet Zarquan, <laughs> who looks like a court jester. <laughs> uh -huh. Look, I'm sorry I'm a bit late. Uh, I had the most ghastly time. All sorts of things cropping up at the last moment. <laughs> How are we for time? <laughs> <laughs> Back on the ship, the little black ship, nobody can figure out what's going on because all the controls are black and on black backgrounds and the labels are black and the lights are black. <laughs> and they're time sick because they're plummeting backwards in time. 
And Zephod thinks they could use a little color about the place, so it's okay if you get sick. <laughs> Zephod says, hey, Ford, that's good. Have you worked out the controls of this boat? Ford says, nope, I just stopped fooling around with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we're going to go wherever this ship is going to go and get on with it. And then they hear this announcement. The black stunt ship is now in position. It's looking good. Going to be a great sun dive. Stage computer <laughs> online. Trillian wants to know what's the sun dive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then Marvin responds, it means that the ship is going to dive into the sun. Sun dive. It's very simple to understand. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect when you steal Hot Black Desiardo's stunt ship? How do you know this is Hot Black stunt ship? <laughs> I parked it for him. <laughs> uh, then Zaphod screams, then why didn't you tell us? <laughs> you said you wanted excitement and adventure and really wild things. And uh, Arthur says, this is awful. Which was Trillian's line, I believe. <laughs> right, right. Then Marvin responds, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely awful. Then there's a being with binoculars. For a face. For a face, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a microphone for a nose. <laughs> oh my gosh. And he's the announcer that is broadcasting the concert. Mm -hmm. Saying there's fine weather here for the concert this afternoon. Standing in front of the stage in the middle of the rudlit desert cacrophoon. <laughs> and above, the sun is shining away and doesn't know what's going to hit it. But the environmentalist lobby knows what's going to hit it. <laughs> they claim that the concert will cause earthquakes, tidal waves, irreparable damage to the atmosphere, and all the usual things environmentalists usually go on about. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And then Zaphod, of course, is begging for help. Yeah, trying to get off the ship. Ford is saying, it's time to get off the ship. Arthur is screaming, how? Zaphod and Ford both say, quiet, we're thinking. And Arthur says the line he says over and over and over. <laughs> so this is it. We're going to die. And then it says to be concluded. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. It can't mean we're at the end of this comic book, does it? Yes. And then it says oh be gosh. with us next time. Mm-hmm. And it kind of gives you a little preview of what's going to be concluded in the third issue of this. Mm-hmm. I still think I prefer the morphing furniture. and <laughs> Yes, I know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I still think that would have been a funnier way to go about this. But I guess they really like the hot black stuff, you know? Right. Well, that's what's in the book. So they kind of mm -hmm. had to stick with that. Yep. Yep. Oh, my gosh. Bio page again. Mm-hmm. And the editorial page again. All the staff members. Then the back cover, where we see the same agonized Arthur worrying about how he's going to die next. And it talks about <laughs> Ford Prefect's theories to account for the particular human habit of continually stating the very, very obvious. Mm-hmm. If human beings don't keep exercising their lips, their mouths will seize up. If human beings don't keep exercising their lips, their brains start working. <laughs> <laughs> so stop moving your lips get your brains in gear and turn to the inside of this issue to find out why arthur dent keeps stating the painfully obvious fact that we're all going to die and that concludes issue two. <laughs> oh, this has been fun yes and again next week will be the second bonus episode where we will do issue three mm-hmm so far in this interpretation of the book, mm -hmm. it seems that they are attributing lines to the different people. So yes. I find that odd because it's yep. there's no reason to do it. It's it's uh, <laughs> all the characters are there. It's not like they've right. edited out a character and they need to give a line to somebody else because the character didn't make it. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'd love to know why they chose that unless in reading the book, they didn't realize who was speaking. <laughs> it's all it's possible or it's just a matter of uh, 
misinterpreting what which bubble goes to which voice. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe it's in the uh, writing of the comic book that it became distorted. All right. So we'll see how many times they do that in issue three. Mm-hmm. And all we can tell you is don't panic. Yes. Because we will be back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes the NPR voice again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hey, Jeff, is it time to say goodbye? I think it's time to say goodbye. All right. Say goodbye, Jeff. So this is it. We're going to die. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Digital Watches Are a Pretty Neat Idea. Look for us the first Thursday of every month for a full episode. We will also release a bonus episode later in the month. A very special thanks goes out to Luke, Max, Greg, and Tim Lesnick, for arranging and performing our opening theme. We would also like to thank our talented friends and family for their voice work on our introductions and commercials. Visit our website at digitalwatchesareaprettyneatidea.buzzsprout.com where you can find links to all my Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy inspired t-shirt designs. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube as Digital Watches Are a Pretty Neat Idea, on Instagram as Watches Idea Podcast, and on Twitter at Watches Idea. If you'd like to contact us, our email is digitalwatchespodcast at gmail.com. <laughs>